praise the Lord. This morning, I'm excited to be alive and to be born again. It doesn't just happen. It takes the hand of the Lord. Amen? And allow me to say that, yes, we are the remnants. The truth is, we are remnants. We're constantly in a place, or in a situation when we, where we do not know what is happening. I don't know about you, but for me, it is okay to say that I'm scared at some point. Every small headache that comes and it's not going, I'm like, ah. Oh. And I know you could be saying you're, you're a coward, Pastor, but I know even you. Every time they are taking your temperature, you're, you're praying. <laughs> Let it be the right temperature, isn't it? There is a God who, who has paid for our sins. And he has the best for us in his heart. He's thinking good about you. He's thinking good about me. Allow me to say I'm married to one wife, Esther, who is here. And uh, I know, even if <laughs> I'll say this, and nobody says amen, <laughs> she'll say amen. My family is also here. Jeff and Joan is, some, Joan is right there. You know what I'm calling Where is Jeff? Jeff Ukwapi. Ah, great. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, we, we are glad and we want to appreciate um, the fact that we could come and just share God's word. I am uh, a son in this house. And uh, I've been brought up here. So everything that I know, I have known to do here. With all my mistakes and with all my flaws, uh, it's from here. And uh, I know you, you'll be gracious when I make a mistake because this is home. Now, at home, when you make a mistake, they don't chase you away. So, having said all that, I want to say that God has paid for my sins and your sins. And I don't know whether you ask yourself, when God paid for our sins, and a topic or a title for this message is God paid God for our sins. <laughs> I don't know whether you ask yourself, when God, in, in the person of Jesus Christ, paid for our sins, who did he pay? When you pay, you pay. When you make a payment, you, you pay to somebody or you pay to whatever it is. But in this case, I want to submit to us that God has paid God for our sins because nobody else would have been paid by God because God didn't owe anybody anything. Amen? And um, in saying this, I want to look at what scripture calls um, the wages of sin. And uh, in, in uh, many uh, engagements out there, and I would wish to do this. There are places that you go and the, the people have like a way to answer back when we read a scripture. And this is, this is, this is how you'll be answering back. Um, Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you will answer, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So can we do that? For the wages of sin is, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know they don't get tired, like I'm, I'm thinking you're getting tired before you even start. Okay, for the wages of sin is but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so you are saying, for the wages of sin is, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Now, that's Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23. And it is a scripture that comes to us. And as you read Romans 6, 23, it tells us that there are wages of sin. Now, wages, when I looked up wages in the dictionary, it says that wages are usually associated with an employee or employee's compensation that is based on the number of hours or on the, the amount of work they have put in. Um, and so that becomes the pay. The wages is the pay for the amount of work, for the amount of hours that you have put in. There is also another um, uh, meaning to it, wages, is the reward or the fruit, the recompense, that which is given or received in return. Are we together? So there is some wage that has been paid because scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Meaning then, that wage or that wages that is death is being paid and it has to be paid. It is, it is, it is paid by death. But scripture continues to say that the gift of God is eternal life. And so, every sin has a wage attached to it. Now, I, I would want us to move from the thinking of the things that we do as sin, but look at the, the condition of your heart or the state of your heart. Because once that is dealt with, which is what Jesus has paid for, the rest, it is for you and me to work on. Now, as long as that wage of sin that has been paid, because it is paid, as long as you have not acknowledged that, then you're saying, because the wage of sin is death, that you will pay. And the payment for it is death. But I also want to submit to you that there is no death that will be able to pay for sin. And so, it is, it, is, it is like, even if you wanted to die for your sin, your death will not pay for your sin. Because there was only one who was able to die or who died to take away the sin. When the animals were slaughtered in the Old Testament, we got to a place where, or scripture gets to a place where, it is not, no longer enough for the animals to die for the sins of man. And so God comes into the scene and says, this condition of the heart of man has to be dealt with. And there was only one who would have been able to do that. Romans 3.23 says, and this is why we are talking about uh, the heart condition. Romans uh, chapter number 3 verse 23 says, It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. It is only through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus that we are justified. It says, verse number 25, that God presented Christ as a sacrifice for atonement through the shedding of his blood, to be received by faith. So Christ dies to pay for our sin, and we receive that sacrifice that was, uh, uh, was, was made for us. We receive this justification, or this atonement of sin is possible when we receive what Christ has done by faith. I am attempting to get to a place where, at the end of this service, you'll know that you have nothing that you have contributed to your salvation. It is a work of God. It is not what you have done. It is not what you have achieved. It is not the education that you have. It is not even the money that you have. It is purely the work of God. And you and me have a responsibility to say yes to that work of God. In the event we don't do that, then we are saying we want to die for our sin. And we have just said, it is not possible for you to die for your sin. Even if you died, you will still be a sinner. Does it make sense? I, I, 
I'm saying this because somebody gave me a post a long time ago, and I didn't know that this would continue making a lot of sense to me. And I think I have shared this here. And this poster was of a, a cat, a kitten. A small cat is a kitten. Mtoto wa pussy. Mtoto wa paka. Kitten. Now, there was this kitten that was on uh, a piano. And it is seated there, or it's lying on the piano. And the inscription or the writings there were, I keep on falling on things that are more fun to do. Now, I'm thinking, but they just enjoy being on the piano and doing funny, funny things. Like you and me, we keep on falling into things that excite us. And before we know it, we realize we have fallen into sin. Now, because of that then, we need to go back to the Lord and have our hearts sorted. In the book of Ephesians, chapter number 2, verse 8 to 9, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that none or no one can boast. And we are asking ourselves, why has God paid the wages? We have just said it's because, number one, there is nobody else who would have paid the wages. And, and, and the wages of sin, because, again, that is a precept. That is, that, is, that is a God thing, that sin has to be paid for. We would wish, if it were you and me who were asked whether sin should be paid for, you would say maybe no. But God designed that sin has to be paid for. And in designing that, he brings out the payment for sin in his son. Scripture says that there was not one who was found worthy to open the, 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 the seals. It is only Jesus Christ. So, why has God paid the wages? Jesus Christ, in the book of Mark chapter number 10 and verse uh, 17 and 18, this is a story of a young man, and scripture says, the long and short of this story is that this is a young man, he is a rich man, and he comes to God, or he comes to Jesus, and, and he's asking uh, how he can become one of the followers of Jesus. Verse 17 says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him, said, good teacher, he's, he's, he knows how to address God, good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus does not go into answering this man. He says, why do you call me good? And right there, he says, no one is good except God alone. And he's not saying that I am good. He actually says, no one is good. It's like you, you're coming and saying, you know, um, um, Dr. Masharia, we know you are a good man. Say, please, don't tell me I'm a good man. I had a request I wanted to make, but this is the way I come to you. And, you know, it's like I'm pampering you. It's like I'm saying, I, I'm pulling your leg. So that after I make the request, you just say, ah, yeah, now that you have elevated me, you have your way. And Jesus said, don't call me good because there is none who is good. And that doesn't mean, so that we don't get confused, that Jesus was not good. Jesus was good before he came, when he came, and after he has gone. So Jesus is not part of the people who are not good. The, part, the people who are not good are you and me. None of us is good. None of us is good. Psalm 14 and verse number 3 says, and this is the scripture that Jesus now quotes when he's, he's, he's uh, talking to this young man. He says, all have turned away. All have become corrupt there is no one who does good, not even one. Now, the story of this young man who wanted to inherit or to become an heir of God's kingdom ends up when Jesus says, now, young man, you are a rich young man. This is how you come into God's kingdom. He didn't say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. No, he said, go home. Sell everything that you have. 
and then come and follow me. Now, that was very hard for this young man because in his heart, there was another God who was called material things. And he looked at what he had, and this is me thinking, and he said, no, I cannot forego this because of following this man. I would rather not have that eternal life. And he says at the end of that uh, account that it is so hard, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than a rich man. Not any rich man, but a rich man who has elevated material things in the place of God. So this is why God has paid for the wages that needed to be paid. And we are answering that God paid himself. There is none who is good. There is none who does what is right. You and I keep on falling into things that are more fun to do. First Timothy chapter number two and verse number six. We are saying that God paid God. I know it doesn't make, make a lot of sense, but God paid God for our sins. And we, we, we will see that because scripture supports that throughout. It says in, in, in First Timothy chapter number two, and this is uh, again the, the, uh, Paul. It says, for there is one God and one mediator. First Timothy chapter number two and verse six. Are we there? Yes, uh, verse number five says, uh, if you start from verse number five. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind. Now, just pause there. If for a moment we thought that, you know, Jesus Christ by coming and dying on the cross, he was appeasing the devil, it is not true. He didn't owe the devil anything. He was not going to pay the devil anything because the devil, as far as God is concerned, he's just a creation. And so scripture tells us in support of that, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind. So the person who mediated between you and God was God himself. And he says, the man Christ Jesus. Verse number six, what does it say? Who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to a proper time. He says he gave himself. It is only God who would have mediated between man and God. And continues to say that he gave himself. He was not, you know, Jesus was not killed. Jesus was not murdered. Jesus was not, Jesus was not defeated. His death on the cross was not a defeating death. He was not overwhelmed by, by, by the people who were uh, persecuting him and, and, and crucifying him. No. What was defeating him when he was going to the cross was the love for you and me. He was paying himself because he has instituted that for that sin, death has to happen. And the only death that was enough was his death. Now, when you check out that word, ransom, ransom means a large amount of money that is demanded in exchange for someone who has been taken prisoner or sometimes for an animal. It simply means that there is something that will be given, something that will be done for you to get what you wanted. I didn't say a lump sum. It's not a lump sum. <laughs> it's a ransom. Hello? And none of us would have become a ransom for sin. Hello? It is only Jesus. And so he becomes that ransom for all people. And that is a good thing. That is a good thing. Because 
no amount of money, not even the animus that existed, nothing would have paid for the sin of men. Jesus Christ comes to the cross and dies for our sin. The scriptures in the Old Testament does seem to say that every sacrifice that was done, and you can check it out, all the sacrifices that were done, and especially by God's people, if it was not worshipped to idols, the sacrifices that are done, every sacrifice that has been offered in the Old Testament was offered to God. Every sacrifice that was done, every sacrifice that was instituted was to God. When Abraham goes to, uh, uh, to, to, to the mountain and he's about to sacrifice, he was going to sacrifice his son to God. The sacrifices that were done once a year, in the day, or on that day of atonement, they were done to God so that the sin or the sins of men would be taken away. Any other sacrifice that is done to another person, to a God, to a people, it is against the will and the purposes of God for you and me. So that when we go to places and we are told the sacrifice for what you have done is so much, or what you need to do for you to get freed from this is one, two, three. A sacrifice, if it is not being offered to God, then it is not in line with Scripture. And so, in the Old Testament, it seems to suggest that it was to God that every sacrifice uh, was being made. And so this argument, if it is anything to go by, it means then that the sacrifice of Jesus as the one and only sufficient sacrifice for sin was to God. We read in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 10, and verse 1 to 18, I'm just going to allude to it. We're not going to read. That whole passage of, of, of Scripture confirms exactly what we have said, that in the Old Testament, sacrifices were, were, were made under the law to God. And the truth is that we have come into a new covenant that will not necessitate you and me to sacrifice animals, because by Jesus Christ dying, then we enter into a new covenant. And the covenant that we are in justifies us because of what Christ has done. We have just said in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2 and verse number 8, that it is not about what you have done. It is not about what you have achieved. It is about what God has done. We realize that when Jesus is... Uh, um, through his life, paying for our sins, he is not paying to the enemy. He is not paying to the devil. Again, I want to say there is no two kingdoms. There is no the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the enemy. Well, in in the sense, I'm not. I'm saying they are not equal. We cannot place God in this kingdom and the devil in this kingdom, and they're in competition. That is not true. It is true that. The, the enemy has a, has a kingdom, just like any one of us would have a, a kingdom. And they are kingdoms of this world. Now, that falls under the kingdoms of this world. But there is only one kingdom. There is only one king. There is only one God. There is only one Lord. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So that we would move from the thinking that God is constantly in competition with the devil. It is not possible for a created being to compete with the creator. You and I are the people who are warring. We, we are fighting the devil. God, is, God is, is, is seated on his throne. And scripture tells us that there is a day that is coming. That the devil himself will be judged. And God is not scared about, hey, it is not like that. Don't think that way. Once you think that way, you are in error. You're thinking your God is, is now under, under, under siege. He's scared that the enemy might... It is not true. The truth is, we have been 
There is a ransom that has been paid. A sin has been paid for. So it is for you and me to keep walking in that victory that has been given that day that Jesus Christ died on the cross. And when we come to the place of acknowledging that Jesus is Lord, then we become the winners. It is true that we might suffer, we might go through hard times like we are going through, but I'm here to encourage us that we, though we go through that, and scripture says though we waste from the outside, the man in the inside needs to be built day each day. Now, those are very, very liberating truths for you and me as a believer. So that we are not scared that God is about to lose. He will never lose. He has never lost. He has won. The battle is won. When Christ died on the cross and he said it is finished, it is actually finished. We have said that God required or desired that sin be paid for because it is him who instituted that that should happen. And, and, I, and I ask myself, why did God require to be paid? The violation that man had done on the glory of God needed to be sorted. God creates man in the Garden of Eden and leaves him there and gives him the mandate to do everything, to till, to tend, to manage, to do all that God had asked him to do. But he willingly surrendered that to the enemy. And so the fellowship that was there between man and God was broken. And scripture says that Adam and Eve had to be banished from the land because if they remained in that situation, there was, no, there was not going to be um, a way of bringing them back. And so God had to banish them from the land because they had willingly surrendered the authority that God had given to the enemy. There is a scene that the Bible calls the scene of um, Horeb. The scene of, yeah, the scene that happened in, the, in, the, in um, Mountain Sinai. When Moses goes to the mountain and he's there for many, many days. The people decided now that Moses has gone and we do not know what is happening and it's taken too long. Um, and we, we are not hearing from God. The man who used to hear from God and tell us what to do, he, he has also disappeared. He actually has left us. This was a setup. He left us in the wilderness and he has gone. We are all alone here. And they converse amongst themselves and they decide in their wisdom to create a God for themselves. Now, that scene of idolatry, that scene of placing whatever else it is in the place of God, it is not something that God takes lightly. You have displaced the place of God in your heart with a golden calf, with an image that has been created, with a person, with a, an institution, with a situation that you are in. That is the sin that God is talking about that needs to be sorted. Once that is sorted, these are the things of, you know, lying here and there, you know, doing that and doing the other. Will be sorted. But as long as in your heart, God has not occupied the first place, we have a problem. The truth is that God, in the person of Jesus Christ, overcame every work of the enemy. And Romans chapter 3 and verse number 25, he would give us that, says, Romans chapter 3, verse number 25, 
This is what it says. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. It is all a work of God. Knowing that there is a condition of the heart that has caused Jesus to die on the cross, and like we are saying, God paying himself, then we can appeal to that place of God. That place of God that causes the Son of God to go to the cross because of love. We can go back to God and appeal to that place of God. Now, there is something that is called the wrath of God. Now, the wrath of God, and, and if you looked out, the meaning of wrath is anger. Now, God, God, God gets angry. And none of us wants to meet the wrath of God. Now, the wrath of God comes upon us, or we will meet the wrath of God, if there is that place in your heart where you have displaced him, like the children of Israel, and put in an image Whatever image it is, whatever thing it is, whether it is the achievements that you have had, if we replace that for a moment, then the wrath of God is ignited. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 9 and verse number 8, it says, At Horeb you aroused the Lord's wrath, so that he was angry enough to destroy you. That is the wrath of God. There is the wrath of God. We talk about a sin that is not forgivable. Now, the sin that cannot be forgiven is the sin that you say in your heart and you are settled that God has not paid for your sins. It is not stealing. It is not murder. It is not those other things that we, we get involved in. It is the position of your heart that says, there is no God. There is no forgiveness. That condition of the heart, God cannot forgive because he has given you and I the will to decide. So brothers and sisters, as we go about and listening to people, there is a sin that cannot be forgiven. Oh, that sin, he stole, he did this, he committed adultery. No, the sin that cannot be forgiven, the sin against the Holy Spirit, who woos us to God, is the sin that says, I don't trust you to save me. You are not enough to save me. Now, in that situation, God cannot save you. Not because he doesn't want, but because you don't want. And I'm saying we can appeal to the love of God, because God is love. I am persuaded that God is not seated in heaven and in our hearts waiting for us to make a mistake so that he can... God is not like that. God is not waiting for you to make a mistake. God is constantly wooing you to have that relationship with him. Now, um, I am... In our house, we live in Zimmerman. Hello. Now, in Zimmerman, <laughs> there are cockroaches. How many know that? Maybe. <laughs> Even in State House, there could be. I, I can bet. In State House. Now, when I see a cockroach in the house, because. <laughs> and you're like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> when I see a cockroach in the house, whether big or small, I hit it very hard. I don't allow it to go. And Esther, <laughs> Esther keeps telling me, <laughs> and I say, that one makes a difference, a lifetime difference to that cockroach. And I don't get tired when I see it. <laughs> I'll hit it. <laughs> when I see another one, I'll hit it. God is not like me and the cockroach? God is not waiting for you to make a mistake and then clobber you. 
God is love. And he has done that many years. And he keeps telling us, receive what I have given you. Receive this gift. Receive the sacrifice that I have given of my own and only son. Because that is the only antidote to the sin or to the heart condition of a fallen man. The wickedness, the corruption, the fallenness in us cannot be settled by anything else. It is only the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. We are not redeemed by silver or gold that is corruptible. Peter says, we are redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. And so we can appeal to the love of God. We can go to God. We can ask God who justifies us. Scripture tells us in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 9 that much more than since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Since we have been justified, it is him who did the work of justifying. He has justified us. So how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath? Because God's wrath remains and it is against that sin, that condition of the heart. So as we go about the things that we do, as we go about doing whatever God has given us to do, that condition of the heart, if you're not sorted, the wrath of God is coming. But we have an opportunity. We can appeal to that love of God, the love that has caused him to justify us. He has willingly said, you guys sinned, you are like this, but I have justified you. Just in case you said yes, that will be settled. Friends, it is good to be saved by God from the consequences of sin because the wrath of God is the response to sin. That is the response that God has to sin. It is good to be saved by God from the consequences of sin because we have said it is only him who is able to save. It is even much better to be saved by God from God God has saved us from the wrath of God. That wrath of God is God's wrath. <laughs> so when God saves us from himself, because all this time that we talk about the time of grace, God is wooing us. He's saying, come. There is an opportunity for you, for me. Keep coming. But there is a day the wrath of God will be released. None of us will be able to stand against the wrath of God. And so our appeal is, let's go to God. He has opened his way. He has opened an avenue for us through his love and through the sacrifice of Jesus. And we can go to him. And the condition of our heart can be changed. Are you there? And you're saying, yes, I keep on falling into things that are more fun to do. The issue is the heart condition. The only person who is able to deal with that is God himself. The payment for the wages of sin is God who can pay that, and he has paid that to God. It is not to the devil. It is not to any other institution or person. God has paid for you and for me through his son, who is also God. And so if you're there, you're saying, I need prayer. I realize that I keep on changing this place of God and allow other things to get into that place that is only God's. If you're there and you want to make that prayer, as we bow our heads, if you lift up your hand, I'll see it. We'll pray together. We sing the heart condition of a man cannot be sorted until we get to the place of acknowledging that Jesus Christ, God himself, died on the cross so that you and I can be saved. You want to give your life to Jesus if you haven't made that um, confession. It starts there. Or you could be there and you're saying, yes, I'm born again, but I, I, this is me, this is the condition of my heart. I keep on 
you know, falling into those things. I keep on missing the mark. I keep on exchanging the place of God with other things. If you shoot up your hand, I'll see it. We'll pray together. It is important for us to do this, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. Are you there? Shall we pray together? Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you this morning. Thank you that you have paid for our sins. Thank you that our Father and our Lord, we do not belong to another. We belong to you. And because of the sacrifice that you have made for us, we are freed. We are redeemed. We are purchased. We become a people of God. We are no longer under God's wrath. We are safe in your hands we pray that in the name of Jesus that as we continue in the things that you have allowed us to do that we'll constantly remember that that place in our hearts that is only supposed to be God's place we will not allow anything else to occupy that place not the things that you have given us not material things not achievements not anything because there is nothing that compares with you and so we want to thank you and ask that our Father and our Lord that the many times that we keep on falling on into things that are more fun to do that you will forgive us and cause us every moment that we realize we have missed the mark to get back to you because you're wooing us. The Holy Spirit of God keeps ministering to us that yes, there is still time that we can make it right with God and that's what we do this morning in the name of Jesus. We ask that you'd forgive us, that you'd cleanse us, that you'd make us the kind of people you want us to be, and that our relationship with our Father will continually be healthy to the praise and to the glory of your dear name. We want to thank you and to honor you. For this moment, we ask that you just do that which you purpose to do in us. We honor you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray.